Hey everybody, thanks for coming to join me. I'm Laura and today we're going to talk about the history of the Big Apple. Now a lot of us know the line dance, or at least the first half of the line dance, but where did it come from? Let's get into it. But first, thank you people of Patreon for helping to make this video free for everybody in the world, including people like you. It's a voluntary subscription and if you want to join them, the link is in the description. The Big Apple did not originate in New York City, but was first done by the black dancers in Columbia, South Carolina in probably the mid 30s. Pinning down exact dates for vernacular dance forms is difficult. The dance hall where it began was originally the House of Peace Synagogue, but after the congregation outgrew it, it was sold under the strict condition that it never be used as a synagogue again. No problem, in 1936, it opened up as a black nightclub called the Big Apple Club. And it's still there today, though it has been moved to a different location in South Carolina, but it still has dances. I have danced in it. Because of strict segregation, this was after all the mid 1930s in the deep south, the main dance floor was reserved only for black patrons. The mezzanine above is where white students from the University of South Carolina watched. From what I understand, the white dancers interpreted what they were seeing as people jazz dancing in a circle as the leader called out the steps. And it was not exclusively solo jazz. There were partnered components and sometimes an individual or a couple would join the middle of the circle and shine much like a jam circle today. Oh my gosh, was it a hit. When the students met each other for vacation at Myrtle Beach, they all told each other about it and they did it at proms and graduations. From the sources I've seen, the original Big Apple dancers were almost certainly inspired by one, the ring shouts from the black populations of the Carolinas and Georgia, which in turn were almost certainly inspired by West African dance cultures. And two, from call dances like the Virginia Reel, which hold up, the called part of the dance, a defining characteristic, was actually innovated by enslaved African musicians playing for the dancers. Unsurprisingly, calling was met with backlash by white critics at the time. Also, according to an article I found by the Smithsonian Magazine, apparently square dancing was also influenced by Native American populations. Apparently in the 1600s, the only fiddler in Maine was a Native American person, which caused certain amount of cultural mixing, which caused European dances to be danced alongside certain and ceremonial Native American dances. Mind blown. What? Can I just say, whitewashing history not only robs communities of their creative ownership and value within a culture, but it also makes history very boring. Also, I want to say just one more thing about square dancing, and I know this is a tangent, but it is so interesting. Square dancing is super famous in the United States, far more famous than Lindy Hop. 28 out of 50 states has it as their official dance, and it's done in the physical education curriculum of many a grade schooler. Why? Well, apparently, Henry Ford, yes, that Henry Ford, hated Charleston and jazz because it was invented by, nope, the Jews as a diabolical plot to corrupt the feeble-minded masses and take over the world. In volume three of Ford's The International Jews series, written in 1921, he writes, Many people have wondered whence come the waves upon waves of musical slush that invade decent homes and set the young people of this generation imitating the drivel of morons. Popular music is a Jewish monopoly. Jazz is a Jewish creation. The mush, slush, the sly suggestion, the abandoned sensuousness of sliding notes are of Jewish origin. Bum, bum, bum. Speaking of anti-Semites, Hitler apparently wrote approvingly of Henry Ford in Mein Kampf. Nice. You gotta love how predictably ill-informed the avid racist is. You don't want to be racist? Learn about people. It might not prevent you from being racist, but I think it'll help. Minimally, you won't look stupid. We will look stupid. Ah, don't be racist try. Anyhow, in spite of the truth, Ford saw square dancing as white and therefore good and decided that popularizing square dancing would counteract the unwholesome influence of jazz in America. So he poured tons of money into square dancing and country music, including publishing a book called Good morning. After a sleep of 25 years, old-fashioned dancing is being revived by Mr. and Mrs. Henry Ford. Just rolls off the tongue. He also required his employees to attend the square dancing events that he organized. He funded fiddling contests. He funded square dancing clubs across the United States. He was also the one who campaigned to bring square dancing to PE classes. Apparently by 1928, almost half of American schools taught square dancing or some other form of old-fashioned 
passion dancing. Not Lindy Hop or Charleston. Now this is important. I'm not saying that square dancing is bad or that Henry Ford wasn't really smart about other things. You can be really smart and still think dumb things and you can be really good and still be used for something bad. Things are complicated. The story is much longer. Links in the description. History is wild. Back to the Big Apple. In 1937, the Roxy Theater from New York City commissioned a traveling stage show based around the Big Apple and cast 16 Columbia dancers. And yes, they were the white dancers. And this is one of the reasons why everybody thinks that swing dancing is a white dance. Admittedly, black dancers from the Big Apple Club also toured regionally, but white dancers were the majority of who was cast and therefore the majority of who got to represent the dance. But I digress. This dance was so popular, even the son of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt celebrated his engagement with the Big Apple dance at the White House to the Big Apple song played by Tommy Dorsey and his Clambake 7, which was a song I didn't even know existed. Now for many, this wasn't just a new dance step. Think of the circle, the calling, the combination of community and individuality. This was a whole new way of experiencing the dance and I would argue a very black American way of experiencing the dance. Though at this point, it's possible many people didn't know that anymore. <laughs> Anyway, Herbert Whitey White, a man who has played a huge role in shaping the Savoy dancers and therefore a modern scene, and I will not do his history justice here, saw the show at the Roxy and knew that it was gold. He took copious notes, gave those notes to Frankie Manning, another man whose influence is too broad to adequately overview here, who happened to be with a team in California preparing a performance for Judy Garland's 1938 film, Everybody Sing. Oh, is that Judy Garland in blackface? Oh, I haven't watched this movie. Dang, history, why do you always do this? Frankie worked on the choreography in the lobby of the hotel and came up with a masterpiece that nobody will get to see because it was not put in the movie because the day of the shoot, Judy Garland got to take a break. Whitey's Lindy Hoppers were not allowed to take a break. So Whitey got in a fight with the director and told his dance team to sit down, which they did. But <laughs> When the movie came out, it had been rewritten, so Judy Garland went to Chinatown instead of to Harlem. Dance scene was just taken out of the movie. And again, let's consider that even if black art is represented, it's not always represented by black artists, because if a black performer demanded respect, it was all too easy to just pull their art. And I know it feels like I'm bringing up this point a lot, but it comes up a lot in this history. White America is constantly falling in love with black art and then denying black people credit or in some cases knowingly harming them. And this not only harms the performers and the artists, but it also harms the art because people's perception of art fundamentally changes the art itself. There's a reason why electro swing is a thing. There's a reason why Hot Topic does the 1940s is a thing. And I don't think that's because of the original black creators. Now I'm not saying that white dancers back in the day who danced Lindy Hop and the Big Apple danced to Electro Swing or wore Hot Topic just in the 1940s. And I'm not saying that white dancers weren't good at dancing. And I'm even not saying that white dancers didn't love and respect black artists and give them credit. But I am saying that the style of dance portrayed by white dancers and black dancers that I've seen represented on film are different. So different that the erasure or even minimization of black representation drastically changes people's perception of the spirit of the dance. And again, things are complicated. There were white Whitey's Lindy Hoppers, Ruthie Rheingold and Harry Rosenberg, and it was documented that they were good and danced in the same style as the black dancers from the Savoy, but because of segregation, we have no video evidence of this because they were not allowed to be on video together. Which, just for myself personally, I would have loved to have seen some white dancers throw down in that style back in the day. When racism is able to cut out founding members of an art form, thereby reshaping the art itself, even if that reshaping is accidental, everybody suffers. Obviously, the original artists suffer a great deal, but the art suffers and everybody who loves the art suffers. And of course, the really insidious thing is that we don't know what we don't know. We don't know frequently that we've been given an incomplete picture. We're looking at this over here and we have no idea that there's all of this to look at. <sighs> I swear that this is just going to be like a nice history of the Big Apple. Speaking of the Big Apple, let's get back to it. In any case, the Big Apple was done socially at the Savoy and it was so popular that they even made a platform for the collar to stand on. 
Here's a version of the Big Apple at the Savoy, and if you look closely, you can even see Leon James looking gorgeous in a white suit calling in the middle. Whitey's Lindy Hoppers were finally able to perform a version of the routine, the version we all know and love, or are in the process of learning right now. In Key Punching from 1939, also check out an amazing jam scene that immediately follows that scene called the Jitterbug Contest. Check it out and learn as much as you can. Each dancer is fire. Simultaneously unique and part of a collective whole. Just amazing. Check out Thomas Tops Lee, Wilda Crawford, Norma Miller, George Greenwich. Joe Daniels, Joyce Daniels, Francis Mickey Jones, William Downs, Lucille Middleton, and of course Frankie Manning. It is a beautiful version of the routine, and this is the point that Bobby White brought to my attention, shout out to Swung Over, is it's only one version of the Big Apple, frozen in time. So I would love to see if you could go to your community and take this idea of the Big Apple and see what you could do with it. See what kind of calls you can have, what kind of community interaction you can have. I would love to see that. Let me know. I hope you had fun and learned a lot. And if you did, click like and subscribe and comment and do all the YouTube algorithm stuff. Is there a cool history story that I missed? Leave a comment. Let me know. I love to learn. Half of the money that I get from this YouTube channel goes towards organizations that support African diasporic artists and art because Lindy Hop is a black dance. Best way to learn how to do this dance is to do this dance. See you next time. Bye-bye.